Hi, Richard. Hi, Bob. How are you? Welcome. Good. Good. Good to see you. Good to see you. Uh, let me introduce this. I'm Robert Wright. Uh, this is The Wright Show, available on both uh, streaming uh, video and audio podcast. You are Richard Prum, uh, professor of ornithology at Yale and also the head curator of vertebrate zoology at the Piedmont Museum there at Yale. Um, and you're the author of The Evolution of Beauty, How Darwin's Forgotten Theory of Mate Choice Shapes the Animal World and Us. Very interesting book. I wish I could hold up the book itself, uh, but I've been reading it on uh, – I've been listening to it actually – so I'm going to hold up my smartphone and show people what the cover would look like uh, if they looked at the actual book. Um, now, uh, there, you, you're making in the book an argument for something you call aesthetic evolution, right? Yeah. Uh, and and you and, and and you say it's kind of underappreciated uh, within your own field. I mean, within evolutionary biology, uh, and it has various interesting applications to humankind and kind of the human uh, predicament. Um, now, I think to uh, before we get into exactly what you mean by aesthetic evolution, it, it probably helps to back up and talk about Darwin's ideas. Uh, because one thing you're arguing is that we've neglected an important part of the way Darwin thought about evolution. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now, Darwin recognized that when he looked at things like peacock tails that he s might seem to have a problem on his hands, right? Because if people think of evolution as being this thing that, that selects traits that help people, you know, live and survive and then reproduce, it's not obvious uh, how, how a peacock's vast tail would do that. You might even think that it would get in the way of day-to-day -day survival. So he recognized he had a problem, right? And uh, do you want to talk about how Darwin thought about the problem and his solution? Yeah, sure. It, 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 coming out of writing The Origin, uh, the evolution of ornament, uh, the, the kinds of uh, uh, beautiful um, details that, 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 that are throughout the animal world, uh, was a real challenge. It was right up there with uh, the lack of a theory of genetics and the absence of any uh, – uh, of any articulated theory about the origins of human beings. These were the, uh, the, the big challenges. And we know that they weighed on Darwin uh, uh, personally. Uh, he wrote in a letter after the origin uh, to Asa Gray that the sight of a feather in a peacock's tail, whenever I look at it, makes me sick. Uh, and uh, it, it, and I, I think that speaks to how personally Darwin saw this challenge. Um, and Unlike some of uh, his followers, uh, Darwin decided to take a different tack, in particular with regard to the evolution of ornaments and armaments, weapons. And he, he argued that they... Right. And can I just pause and say, you know, a, a deer's antlers might seem to pose a similar problem. You've got to carry the antlers around. That can't help you as you move around in day-to-day -day life. So that's a case where it's not an ornament so much perhaps as an armament, but it's the same problem. Yeah, the same challenge. Th those those aspects of the phenotype that were that were not useful in survival or fecundity, right? In, in, and 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 uh, uh, he came up with what I think, in in retrospect, is an incredibly wily and foxy new idea. He basically said that these things evolve as a result of uh, a differential success of heritable variations in terms of reproductive success, in terms of the ability to obtain mates. Uh, and and that uh, was either through male male competition or usually male male competition competition within a sex for control over mating opportunities, and that gave rise to the antlers, right? And then uh, uh, or a, a mate choice, uh, individuals of one sex selecting their mates from among the available individuals of the other sex uh, to allow them to uh, um, uh, choose their mates, and that. Uh, you know, in particular, uh, regard to ornament, he um, he proposed that um, mate choice was a major force in in, in evolutionary biology. So, so uh, the point of a peacock's tail, from the male's point of view, although of course he's not thinking about this, is is that it will uh, it will encourage females to mate with him and help him get his genes in the next generation. In that way, uh, same thing with the antlers except that it's probably less a matter of the female admiring. Well, it may be a female admiring the antlers, but they may have the antlers may have had their origin in fighting among uh, males 
uh, to get access to the female. And e and e but both of those would qual all those dynamics would qualify as sexual selection, right? right. The sexual selection included this this uh, competition within a sex and choice among sexes. Okay. And, and and actually, there's a really rich and interesting uh, area for new theory in the aesthetics, if you will, of armaments, you know, just the fruit salad that you see on, on military uniforms, et cetera, or, uh, or football team or, uh, uniforms and mascots. This is about something. And I, so I think that there's more to be said there, but, but, but the focus of the book and actually the much larger and more important theoretical focus for Darwin was the consequences of mate choice. And his theory of mate choice had a couple of really interesting, uh, aspects to it. The first was that it was explicitly aesthetic. And by that, he used the normal, ordinary language description of aesthetic response, beauty, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and, and charm and delight uh, in terms of describing it. And, and in retrospect, well, for most of the, the, the last century, more than a century, people have been thinking that this was kind of a quirk of Darwin's, right? And, and in fact, this, these, this language is not, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, Darwin going soggy on the edges. This is an explicit statement about what it was talking about, which was that uh, animal preferences, the subjective experience of animals, were actively the basis of their choices, that there were things that they liked and did not like and preferred, and that they were active agents in their own evolution. Okay. Right. Now, aspect uh, of, of his, just before I go, the other aspect of his theory was actually explicitly co-evolutionary. That is, what he imagined was that the ornament was co-evolving with the preference. That is just in the same way that uh, we can imagine uh, innovation in, in the tail, giving rise to new sorts of features that females could select upon, that the female innovations in preference would also affect right. the tail, that they were mutually, mutually interacting. And, and so this aesthetic and co-evolutionary aspects, I think, are the core of Darwin's idea about mate choice. Right. Because once females are paying attention to, say, how colorful and large your feathers are, then it makes sense from the male's point of view. Again, not that they think about this, but natural selection kind of in a certain metaphorical sense does the thinking or, well, we'll get into the question of whether yeah. we should call sexual selection natural selection later. But, yeah. but anyway, the point is, although the male is not thinking about this, evolution would tend to encourage still larger and more colorful feathers because they are preferred by females. Exactly. And, 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 and so what this is, is, is an additional dimension to the kind of evolutionary success that Darwin outlined in Origin. Right. And, 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 um, and as you inferred, Darwin's idea about sexual selection uh, was explicitly proposed as a distinct mechanism of evolution. And that is not the direction that evolutionary biology took uh, in the 20th century. Right. Uh, it isn't that it rejected uh, sexual selection, but it, but that it it, it 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 thinks of it as a subset of natural selection. By and large, there are exceptions. There are biologists who would rather think of them as, in I guess, in some sense, co-equal. But but uh, but what happened was they kind of defined natural selection. They just said, look, the most general way to state the principle is to say that um, the, uh, the those genetically based traits that are most conducive to the proliferation of the genes are the traits that will do best. And that's natural selection. And that encompasses antlers and it encompasses for what, regardless of why colorful feathers help you get more genes into the next generation. And now we're going to turn to that subject a little more. But, but the point is in the 20th century, they decided to define natural selection in the most general possible terms to include sexual selection, not necessarily to reject it. Right. That's the, that's been the ultimate solution. And, 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 and indeed, uh, one of the big points of my book and one that I think will hopefully, uh, uh, be intellectually disruptive. <laughs> and, and that is, I, I argue strongly, we need to return to Darwin's view that natural and sexual selection ought to be, uh, have distinctive, uh, definitions and that the, the, the kind of, uh, what most people imagine as adaptive made choice, uh, is, is a kind of interaction, uh, between them.
But maybe we, we can go there to, to essentially what was the response to, to Darwin's idea? Well, um, uh, you know, the idea that of male-male competition structuring uh, nature and being an important force in evolution was uh, basically universally adopted as obvious. Uh, and I think that has a lot to do with Victorian times, the idea that, that uh, male power uh, structured the world, the natural world, as well as the, the, the Victorian cultural world, made a lot of sense. And I think it actually contributed in a deep way to the acceptance of evolution a, as a concept. And I think that would be the subject for lots of interesting work. However, his idea about mate choice was a big loser. Uh, basically, uh, a few people were interested in it, but it was immediately uh, criticized uh, and, and, and rigorously criticized, ultimately, mostly by Alfred Russell Wallace, the co-discoverer of of, of uh, adaptation by natural selection. And, and so um, uh, Darwin's idea of mate choice had a tough time and uh, was uh, parodied in many ways and ultimately rejected for almost all of a century. And, 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 and that's, an interesting, that's an interesting aspect. Um, uh, when we look at Wallace's critiques, it has a very interesting quality. Um, he made all sorts of statements about the crazy, what we think of as almost crazy ideas. For example, he said, well, you know, if you open up the body of an organism, you see that the spleen and the liver and the kidneys are all brightly colored. Well, the peacock is just the same thing, but on the outside, right? This is just the vigor of life itself. Okay. Life is vigorous and vigorous life begets uh, a color. It has, it's like a dynamic property of life. And that, and that all, uh, uh, so that's just what life is. And that, and or, or that, that or doesn't dra- account for how big and cumbersome the peacock's tail is, but still. Right. R- indeed. And, and, and that shows. So, 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 so he tried to limit the possibility of sexual selection as, as a, as a force, but he was unable to entirely reject it. And in some of those statements, when he did reject it, or, or when he, when he admitted that it could happen, uh, he made some very interesting statements. He basically said that the only way it could happen is if uh, is if uh, the display, beauty uh, or ornament, was correlated with uh, vigor, fitness, and ability to 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 compete. Mm-hmm. Right. right. So, and, so that's it, that that gets to something I wanted to emphasize, which is that. Uh, now, as you go on to tell the historical story in the book, uh, you, you know, the, the, the idea of female choice does start getting some respect in the 20th century. But then uh, in the near the end of the 20th century, uh, it, it loses more respect than you think it should lose. You think it deserves uh, a lot more respect. But I want to emphasize that the people uh, who who don't think of it the way you think of it, that it should be thought of. They're not denying that female choice can be significant, right? The big question is, what drives the female choice? Why did why did peahens come to like in in Darwinian terms, in evolutionary terms? What was in it for the peahen to favor large, colorful tails, right? I mean, that's really that's the, the argument, right? And the importance of, the importance of the Wallacean uh, the Wallace story is that Wallace basically invented the idea that beauty is a kind of adaptive utility Mm -hmm. that beauty uh, ornament in nature provides information that mates need to know Mm -hmm. because uh they're under selection to have uh, better fitter uh finer offspring right and uh of course this is it's interesting uh most people don't understand that role in wallace's work and they imagine that the idea that's popular today uh, uh adaptive mate choice that is that that ornament is a way of, uh, of, 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 of selecting mates of, of universally outstanding quality, right, uh, is, is, is a Darwinian idea. But it's, a, and it's, it's exactly antagonistic to, to Darwin. And in fact, it's actually part of the idea that was used to kill sexual selection for almost a century, right? Because Wallace's gambit was to say, well, if this is the case, if ornament is just a kind of uh, of adaptive information, then we don't need the concept of mate choice. We don't need the concept of sexual selection uh, because we already have the idea of natural selection. In the modern era, what people have done is identify, revamp the word sexual selection, which, which the phrase that, that, that Wallace rejected, but essentially keep the Wallacean view, which is that sexual selection is mm-hmm. under control of adaptation by natural selection. Okay. And the original uh, uh, Darwinian idea is that uh, the benefit of mate choice can be merely popularity itself, 
right? Uh, and that that be, basically, once something is charming, uh, then being charming is its own advantage, uh, and and the result is kind of uh, 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 a a coevolutionary market bubble mm-hmm. where uh, where beauty evolves, right? Or, so, or, 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 so now you're talking about the, the Ronald Fisher's view of the thing, right? Sure, but I think that that that, that Fisher is explicit that this is an explication of Darwin's uh, ideas, sure. right? Now he gets he uses new vocabulary and he gets into a more genetic mode of how it could actually expand. But the statements uh, by Darwin in 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 Descent of Man, his book on sexual selection, are as uh, as detailed as they are for his statements about natural selection, sure. which are considered to be brilliantly prescient and certainly uh, not uh, uh, those ideas aren't given to uh, W. Jansky and Sewell Wright and uh, uh, and Morgan later on. They're considered Darwinian ideas. Okay, so and just to be clear on what the idea here is, the one that that Ronald Fisher is especially associated with, uh, and I think still has a, a, a fair number of adherents today. I mean, I, I, I uh, but but in any event, it's I, I mean certainly when I kind of learned my evolution of biology, it was I th- I think it was almost taken as the standard explanation. But anyway, here's the explanation. It's that, uh, and and you alluded to it, but I want to make sure people understand, which is that, you know, why does it make sense uh, for the female to to like large colorful tails? Well, leaving aside where that preference originally came from, once it is part of the species, once females in general are preferring large colorful tails, then it's in the interest of the female to mate with males with large colorful tails, because then she will have sons who are themselves sexually attractive, right? Right. And so, and, the, and, and the so advantage there of ornament is that it uh, it gives rise to competitive advantage in the attraction uh, of, of of mates and more grandchildren, right? Having children that are sexually attractive is an indirect genetic benefit, and that is the the benefit that drives uh, the evolution of, of of ornament in the Darwinian and Fisherian view. Right. And unlike the Wallacean view, the form of the beauty will be itself arbitrary. That is, it doesn't include information about anything right. that mates need to know. It's merely subject to preferences. It's, it's only the result of do I like that or not? Although it could well have originally signified some uh, fitness in that uh, kind of 19th century sense, right? In other words, if originally females are drawn to colorful feathers because they demonstrate resistance to parasites or something, it can still be the case that this second kind of dynamic takes over and, and, and females favor them more and more just because females favor them. Yeah. But I, you know, uh, that's, uh, that's, you're, you're exactly right. Uh, but that, that kind of framework is, is one that people have uh, discussed in, 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 in frequently. Um, but I really think that the origin of ornament and how it evolves are, 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 are really two different topics. In fact, you know, for example, we have, uh, you know, reproductive behavioral ecology, which dictates, you know, talks about all the different ways in which investment by one sex or the other give rise to different kind of breeding systems, et cetera. Right. But the origin of sex is itself a different question. Right. And so uh, for reasons that are mysterious, they have become concatenated, combined in. Now, in the case of birds, the origin of preference or a mate mating preference occurred in dinosaurs back in the Jurassic prior to the origin of birds and prior to the origin of flight. It has been consistently present and is universally present in all species of birds, right? So this idea that the origin is somehow related, the origin, that one has to explain the origin of the preference is uh, no one would approach human biology and say, well, how does that data explain the origin of sex in people? Well, no, it didn't happen. No, they're they're empirically two largely different questions. My point is just that both could be the case. The thing, right. the, the, the dynamic could have its origin in what you could call honest advertisement. You know, the male is the the feathers signify something about just old fashioned fitness in the sense of robustness. And then the second dynamic takes over, and you get this in some ways absurd positive feedback system that leads to these birds that have trouble walking. Yeah, <laughs> so. and, what, and, what, and what and what Fisher articulated was how difficult it would be to prevent that arbitrary process from happening. Right. Now, you refer to the fact and, uh, that, that, that Fisher is commonly taught, and I agree. It's a part of uh, all, the, all the textbooks, that, but, but it's considered to be intellectually interesting, but it, it essentially uh, uh, almost irrelevant to nature. And that has to do with, with, with the way in which our modern framework of thinking about sexual selection is still thoroughly Wallacean. 
And that's why, uh, you know, it's Darwin's forgotten theory It's because people have forgotten what Darwin really said and have uh, and, and, and that and that th those contributions are really underrepresented or even forgotten in the modern world, in the modern in the modern intellectual field. Right. And that is that people have seen uh, uh, Fisher as an interesting idea. But but the but the intellectual examples of it are basically uh, considered to be zero. Uh, or nearly zero. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and, and that's and that and that's that's where I'm really pushing people uh, in in, yeah. in the in the scientific field to 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 reframe how they think of the Fisherian alternative. Yeah. Now I would have uh, I would think a lot of people go well. What else could the explanation be? In other words, once the feathers get this big and unwieldy. You can't say that that's that 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 the female is 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 like that. It's an assessment of the male's, you know, kind of just robustness, ability to go around getting food and and, okay. and blah blah blah. There has to be some kind of Fisherian runaway hypothesis. But it turns out apparently in the in the twentieth century, a new hypothesis arose that depicted the uh, things like big feathers as in some sense honest advertising of just kind of physical robustness. This is Zahavi's handicap yeah. theory. So do you want to talk about, and, and that I would say just to set the, you know, from your point of view, the, 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 uh, the Fisherian runaway hypothesis is, is the kind of thing that you think deserves emphasis, isn't getting enough. Uh, and then the Zahavi is the, the main, I guess, modern exemplar of of the view that you think is much overemphasized, where the female choice is thought to involve just assessing kind of straightforward advertisements of robustness, right? Yeah, and 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 Zahavi's idea was really a, a straight up Wallacean idea, though he didn't know it at the time, right? He, uh, like everyone else, had uh, had had sort of bought the history that Wallace rejected sexual selection as opposed to synonymizing it with natural selection. In any case, he he proposed that the the uh, the point of an ornament is to create an extremity, an extreme cost, merely to show that the male is good enough to survive that cost. And he called this the handicap principle because he thought of ornament as literally a handicap on the capacity of uh, the individual to create and survive uh, with this complex ornament. Right. And this has been a very popular idea and it has fed the broader concept that in, in general, uh, that ornament is about communicating quality. Right? right. And and the way it works is is uh, is, you know, that, uh, you know, uh, a, a diamond ring as a, as an engagement ring is some kind of uh, indicator of the of uh, of a potential mate's ability to 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 invest by investing in something that is genuinely useless. Uh, you can show that you have uh, resources to waste, essentially, which means that you have more than enough than you need. The problem, of course, is uh, exactly that. If if uh, 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 you get an engagement ring that's worth so many months of salary uh, that your mate no longer uh, can put food on the table or that nobody's eating, well, then you've really uh, messed up, right? And uh, the only case in which this can be uh, 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 useful, the only way, way Zahavi can work is if quality is distributed in the animal kingdom the way money is distributed in, 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 in human economies. That is that some people have money to waste and some people don't have enough, right? And uh, that turns out to be a way to salvage the hobby, but it's one that uh, um, remains uh, curiously untested uh, in, as far as I know, a single example. Right. So Zahavi's idea has been tremendously influential, and yet the fundamentals of it uh, are, are still quite problematic. Yeah, I was always when I first encountered it, I, 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 I had a, a skepticism. It seemed par too paradoxical in a way that I couldn't completely, completely articulate. Uh, and I still don't think I, I've managed to think about it clearly enough to completely evaluate it. But, but the idea was the, just that the logical uh, conclusion of this process is to have uh, a handicap that exactly negates the advantage you're supposedly advertising with the handicap. But, but I don't. Yeah. I don't know that that's true, right? In other words, if I can carry 10 pounds more than the next male, so I walk around carrying 10 pounds and it's physically attached to me, so I have to always carry it, then I'm not a pre preferable mate to the other guy because it exactly cancels out the strength I'm advertising. Now, is that is that 
is that related to your skepticism? That, 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 that's, that's the fundamental problem. What, what happened historically, of course, is once, once Zahavi's idea was intellectually salvaged, that is, once it was found a way that, uh, that uh, it, it, it could work, uh, people didn't proceed to then test it. Uh, they proceeded to have a faith in it. Right. And so uh, basically, uh, you know, uh, the, since the 1990s, uh, most of adaptive um, uh, 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 mate choice research proceeds in the following way. They say, well, uh, we're going to measure all these aspects of the ornament uh, or, 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 or male display. Uh, and we're going to try to correlate them with all these aspects of fitness, the, 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 uh, you know, uh, other kinds of quality. And then we're going to see which ones um, uh, uh, are actually good. And if we support the theory, Right, that that some aspect of of ornament uh, gives honest information about uh, objective quality. Then we'll conclude that the theory is supported. If we don't find it, we'll just conclude that we haven't worked hard enough to find it. And so this means that Zahavi never gets tested, that the Fisherian alternative is never taken seriously, and that Darwin's uh, actual contribution to 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 the to the field is is marginalized and I and I would say forgotten. Right. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the, the real interesting intellectual challenge to evolutionary biology today is, you know, how do we know whether uh, mate choice is adaptive or not? Well, as in other areas of biology, we have to demonstrate that it's adaptive. That is, the burden of proof is on the Wallacean, Zahavian, honest advertisement uh, field. Now, when uh, you use the term adaptive, are you using that to distinguish the Zahavi theory from a more Fisherian? Uh, uh, absolutely. I mean, you know, I mean, uh, you know, I would I would restrict, as Darwin did, the definition of adaptation mm -hmm. uh, to differential survival and fecundity. Right. Okay. Those so, variations that evolve as a result of uh, 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 of heritable differences in in uh, in the ability to survive and uh, and fecundity, the richness of reproduction okay, and that which, sexual which... sexual success is another dimension uh, right. and that adaptive made choice can arise as a result of of interactions between those and and one of those things is that in the way that i define natural selection it's always going to lead to adaptation which is a greater fit between some aspect of phenotype and the environmental challenges within the phenotype right, right. uh one once you you so so uh, but the peacock's that, tail does lead to successful reproduction right Right, but I think that that's sexual selection. So, right? but, but, but didn't you just say natural selection is things that lead to survival and reproduction? It's the survival and fecundity. Fecundity being your capacity to reproduce. That is the number of ova or the number of sperm you okay. can reproduce, not okay. whether or not they actually make it through. Okay. So, so it's, a, it's about the, the currency, the actual currency that we think of, we think of adaptation. Yeah. What's interesting is that the, 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 the functional substrate of, of, of ornament is 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 not in relation to any other aspect of the world, but uh, the 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 aggregate perceptions of potential mates, right? And that's a dynamic and different kind of uh, of success uh, than all the other kinds of uh, components of natural selection, okay. and and that's why I think Darwin isolated them, and that's why I think it's important to do so. Okay. So just to be clear, this is just a little terminology footnote for people to make sure. Uh, they they get it. Um, you are uh, you're favoring a certain view of female choice uh, that is well that that might be more fisherian, but but in any sense sees the choice as not necessarily uh, depending on kind of uh, honest you know straightforward signals of of, of robustness, um, and you are. You're you're not associating the word adaptation with that kind of sexual selection, right? And and I just want to say that, and that is, the, and I would also I would add to that 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 describing mate choice as a as as a distinctive from an adaptive process is a legitimately Darwinian mm -hmm. point. That is the Darwinian view that has been uh, uh, laundered from Adam. I call this Darwin's really dangerous idea, a Dar an idea so dangerous that it had to be laundered, removed from uh, evolutionary biology because of uh, the the strength of the Wallacean tradition, okay. the tradition that I would describe today as adaptationist, the concept that adaptation by natural selection is a strong force that dictates mm -hmm. all of the important processes in evolutionary biology. Okay. This is very similar to the idea in, in, in economics uh, 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 of, of, of free market theory or efficient markets, right? Where uh, essentially, um, you know, a, a certain clique of, of economists uh, have taken a 
portion of the theory and expanded it and redefined it as central to the discipline by maintaining uh, uh, that uh, competition and markets uh, and access to information provide a complete and full theory of the important details in economics. And those things that are don't fit that are either defined out of the field or considered to be irrelevant or noise. And, you know, that's a very similar intellectual tradition to to what's happened in evolutionary biology. So this is part of a bigger uh, uh, issue with addressing the adaptationist tradition okay. in, in, in evolution. Okay, just to finish the footnotes, there are people who use adaptation more broadly. Uh, again, the idea is that uh, natural, the idea of natural selection is just that those genes that are most conducive to their own replication uh, are the ones that do well, uh, regardless of how they are conducive to their own replication. They define adaptation as the, the, you know, the adaptive traits as the traits that are created by that process. That would include what you're calling sexual selection. And I just want to be clear because, adapt, you know, um, somebody like Ronald Fisher, I think, would have had the more general definition of, of natural selection, probably, and yet he subscribed to your conception of how female choice uh, works. So that, I'm just, I'm just emphasizing. We don't need to dwell on this. I just want to emphasize because people maybe get get confused having heard the word adaptation. A, a, a state, a state. You know, for for people who are uh, who are uh, think that they're uh, or have been exposed to a lot of contemporary evolutionary biology. A state of confusion, I think it's a state of progress because a lot of people, I think, have views, including my own colleagues, that are preventing us from actually describing the way nature is, yeah. right? And that we got to switch these ideas. We got to transform them in a way that, that gives us tools to understand nature better. This is, this, it, there's a lot at stake here. And basically, what's at stake is whether or not we're accurately describing uh, the natural world. And yeah. I think the, the adaptive uh, mate right. choice model does a singularly bad job of it. And and that okay. uh, one of the reasons is the, the all these intellectual uh, the yeah. intellectual of the the, 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 the other reason the yeah. the other reason I want to make the distinction is because a lot of times when and I don't want to get into this please don't answer this question <laughs> it's not a question I just yeah. want to say it the the a lot of times uh, when a lot of people have rejected what they call adaptationism have been talking about what are called spandrels like Stephen Jay Gould, would would dismiss adaptationism and talk about things that seem adaptive but actually don't have any function at all. And he wasn't necessarily talking about things produced by sexual selection. So I'm just saying uh, there are different ways to reject adaptationism. It depends on what you mean by adaptationism, what they mean, and, and so on. So I ha I do have a question for you. Um, I, I, was so, I, I guess the question is why is you, why do you associate your view – uh, of sexual, of female choice with uh, the word aesthetic, I, I would think that uh, even if Zahabi is right, and by the way, my intuition tells me he's not, but even if he's right uh, and, and Fisher is wrong um, about why, uh, how female choice usually operates, in other words, even if, if uh, you know, their they're, females are assessing just, just robustness of male or whatever, um, I would think that, that still... The female considers the trait beautiful. I mean, the female considers this, the trait attractive. That's how the process is working. We're talking about uh, what things genes are going to make females desire. And I would think that regardless of wh what the explanation is, the desire is going to be subjective desire and things are going to appear attractive. So you could use the word aesthetic. Absolutely. And in the book, I'm, I, I hope I make clear that, uh, that, that the concept of aesthetics applies to mate choice in all of its forms, whether it's adaptive or not. So I agree entirely. A Lamborghini or a Rolex are both beautiful, even though they function really well in, in certain ways, right? So there's no complication between having uh, an explicit overt adaptive function and being beautiful. In, in fact, they're all beautiful. But, but by adopting the aesthetic language, by by using beauty in a scientific context, I I hope to 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 disrupt what most people's uh, tendency has been, which is to say, um, oh, uh, beauty or ornament is just another kind of utility, and this allows us to not recognize or to deny the subjective agency of individual choices, right? That we that 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 there's something going on in the head that the individuals themselves are deciding for themselves. Do I like that or not? 
right? But you agree with me that they're deciding that in any event, regardless of what the explanation is. But, but we but we but we diminish the consequence of those decisions. And and I think uh, the whole progress of the book going into uh, sexual conflict and into human evolution shows the productivity of actually taking on uh, the aesthetic view. That okay. is, uh, the aesthetic it incorporates the adaptive, but not other way around. Okay, so when you. And, and, and that's why it's, that's why it's that's why it's uh, it's an intellectually I think it's an important move. Okay, but you are. A, I mean, let me just read a sentence. You say generations of anti-aesthetic sexual biology, such as the hobby's handicap theory, uh, entirely ignored and denied the existence of the subjective experience of sexual pleasure. You're saying the hobby says that females do not have a subjective experience of of uh, sexual pleasure. Well, the, the whole the whole fact that uh, I mean, look, there are a lot of people you probably interviewed uh, a dozen of them who think that you and I don't have consciousness or subjective experiences. Right. You know, right. But so, that, that question seems to me independent of the question that that uh, that yeah, divides yeah. So, you and Zahavi. I think that nobody in evolutionary biology has been citing Nagel and, and raising subjective experiences as as a necessary part of evolutionary biology because of the fear of reliving the rejection that Wallace posed or the challenges that Wallace posed to 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 Darwin right which is that we want to think of animals as automata being wound up and just spinning around and leading to uh, to uh, to adaptive uh, to ap- adaptive outlook look in numerous ways today you've said well they don't need to be thinking about it right you know it's no, showing- no 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 let me be clear let me be clear i said they don't need to be thinking about the underlying logic of natural selection they don't need to be thinking this is going to help me get genes in the next generation that's a completely different question well, I, I, I i'm saying what you and zahavi so i'd I- be interested to know what my what my what what uh, adaptive theorists would say about the subjective experience of animals, but the fact is they've never even raised the issue. And I think that shows that that the adaptive move is to put a lid on, uh, to explain away rather than explain animal choices, right? And it's the fact that we've never had even had to ask the question, what do they like? What are the consequences of getting what you like and not getting what you like, right? This hasn't happened in the discipline because we have not taken the broader aesthetic view. I mean, really, what we need to say is, that, and this is why people have, have been so afraid of Fisher. This is why it's Darwin's really dangerous idea, because it's corrosive to the idea of adaptation as a strong force that dictates all the important details. And many people in evolutionary biology got into the discipline in order to champion and to continue to uh, put forward that idea. And so uh, their worldview is challenged by these kinds of these kinds of perspectives now does mate choice require animals have subjective things absolutely i think so uh, i i'm hope i'm putting the point to others so that they will be forced to admit that for themselves regardless of whether they think it's an adaptive process or not so you don't mind you don't mean when you say his theory denied the existence of the subjective experience that it literally explicitly does or even by logical implication you just think Something about the drift of the theory doesn't encourage people to reflect on subjective experience. I think I, I, I mean, I put it in notch. I don't think they even bothered to publish. We deny the existence of the sex of but animals. Do you think he really would? Do you think Zahavi would? Well, Zahavi, unfortunately, died about uh, a week after the book came out. I hope that wasn't causal. Uh, but uh, uh, but uh, but uh, uh, and I spoke, uh, oh, a couple years ago in Jerusalem, invited him and he wasn't able to make the talk. Okay. Uh, so so I don't know. Uh, uh, but I do know that this move has not happened. And I do think that that that, that the work has uh, functionally, if not explicitly, denied the existence of of animal subjective experiences. Okay. I, so, I mean, I mean, raise the issue. So when let's I, talk I, about I, some uh, ways that uh, thinking about female choice uh, has, has influenced your view of, of human evolution. There's uh, some uh, some interesting ideas like uh the de-weaponization in males, meaning that if you look at some of our uh, ancestors, distant, somewhat distant ancestors, you would see in males like, you know, fangs, I guess, right? That yeah. that, that that presumably now, now uh, is it that they might have both used them in combat with males over sexual partners and that they might have used them to physically subdue sexual partners who didn't want to be sexual partners? Is it uh, both of those things or? Yeah. So, so be- before we dive into to, 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 to the evolution of human sexuality, 
uh, we both need a few caveats and maybe a little bit more evolutionary biology because the, the middle third of the book basically is about sexual conflict uh, starting in, 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 in birds, right? And, and, and this uh, explores what happens when, um, when sexual preferences are disrupted by coercion and sexual violence. Right. And it starts with a, a chapter on duck sex. Right. And, and basically the bottom line of duck sex is that uh, females have preferences and, uh, and 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 create pairs with particular males that have the ornaments they like. Uh, but then a number of members of the population also pursue uh, 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 essentially a forced copulation strategy. They uh, pursue essentially rape in the duck world. And this is a real challenge to ducks. And what we've discovered in, in work with Patty Brennan now at, at, at uh, Mount Holyoke um, is that there's an arms race, a genitalic arms race between male genitalia and female genitalia. So over evolutionary time, there was an arm, there was such an arms race. Right. And so, and that, and that what happens is that uh, males evolve a larger and larger penis and uh, with more and more armaments uh, on it. And then females evolve a convoluted vagina that allows them to prevent fertilization during forced copulation. They have essentially an FDA approvable birth control method that they can behaviorally deploy inside their bodies in response to forced copulation. And what this shows is that uh, uh, something that is a revelation to the whole field of sexual conflict, which is there is, and, and, and that shows the, the advantage of the of the of the aesthetic uh, um, uh, perspective. Because by understanding that there is something the female wants, you can conceive of what is going on when she doesn't get what she wants as a result of coercion and violence, right? And the answer is that freedom of choice matters to animals. Right. That the ability to assert one's sexual autonomy is an evolutionary advantage. Mm -hmm. Why? Because if a female has the uh, mates with the male she likes, then her offspring will be sexually attractive to other females. If she's forcibly fertilized by a random male or by one she's explicitly rejected, her offspring have a lower likelihood of inheriting the ornaments that other females like. That's the indirect genetic cost of sexual violence to her. Right. And so any feature that evolves that allows her to avoid that cost will advance. And this uh, what we can see in ducks. So ducks are in some cases we have um, uh, 40, 50 percent of the populations in these wild population will be forced, will be essentially rape. Right. Mm -hmm. And and only two to five percent of the offspring in the young and the nest are are extra pair. Right. So they are enormously successful at defending their capacity to make choices. Now, uh, other birds do it in a different way. Instead of having an arms race, what they do is use mate choice to take apart maleness in ways that advantage their own autonomy. And the great uh, example of this is the bower bird, right, which has this ornamental structure. It's a seduction theater made by the bird. And the, the female sits inside. Some of them have walls on the side and the male displays in the front. Right. And uh, so the thing about the bower is that the bower is beautiful. It's got architecture and it's full of ornaments, but it also protects her uh, from being uh, sexually assaulted. Mm -hmm. If the male wants to copulate, he has to go around the back, which gives her a chance to pop out the front. Mm -hmm. So it has this additional function of allowing her to get as close as she wants and still prefer and still maintain her ability to choose. So I call this aesthetic remodeling. It's a kind of way of changing maleness in ways that further our sexual autonomy, right? Now, uh, I, I propose in the book that, uh, that aesthetic remodeling has been an essential part of the evolution of human beings and human sexuality. And, and, and I do that because uh, following the reason. If we look at our uh, closest uh, relatives in gorillas and chimpanzees, we see that um, the biggest source of infant mortality uh, is uh, is infanticide by males, right? It accounts for 30% of the mortality of uh, – or 30% of all the mortality in the – right? Um, this is startlingly high, right? And human males are still responsible for most of the violence and evil in the world. And uh, – but you know what? Uh, males – human males do not murder babies for their own sexual advantage. In even a measurable way, right? And this constitutes a tremendous transformation. In addition, chimpanzees and gorilla males don't even identify with their own offspring. They don't even know or care who they are, right? They make no investments in reproduction. And human males are 
unlike that. Uh, in all cultures, all societies, males not only identify with their offspring, but invest in them, right? And the question is, how did those systems evolve? And I, I, I state uh, that they were likely to evolve through female choice, right? So that's the big idea. Um, in particular, I think the way in which to get um, uh, uh, ape, our ape ancestors to keep from murdering babies mm -hmm. is to make it unsexy, Right. To make the capacity for sexual coercion unsexy, so and to, and there you two, mean to favor to to favor uh, non murderous males to have sex with non murderous but, males, but not with but, murderous. But males. It has to be it has to be phenotypically distinguishable when 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 you're when you're when you're when you're when you're, when you're not subjected to murder because basically your average chimp and your average gorilla male is a a, a homicidal psychopath waiting for his moment. Now, okay, so uh, if we uh, imagine this time uh, in human uh, evolution when uh, apparently males were more aggressive sexually and more effective at constraining female sexual choice, and, and apparently I think your idea is used violence sometimes to do it or physical coercion sometimes to constrain female choice. And infanticide are all kinds of sexual coercion. Right. And the way in which you put an end to sexual coercion is either through an arms race, which leads to uh, uh, that limits the success of coercion, but not the the investment, the cost of it. Or, but the way, the Bowerbird way, the aesthetic remodeling is to transform maleness into a form that is more amenable to female autonomy. Okay, but what's I'm I'm curious what what do you think happened in human evolution to change this? Because I mean, in any species where males are constraining female choice physically. Obviously, I think I think you'd agree it would be in the genetic interest of the female to have more choice. But for some reason or other, uh, I, I mean, now that the males have these weapons, this physical dominance, or or maybe it has to do with the circumstances in which they encounter the females, whatever uh, the males are dominating. Now, if it were trivially easy for the female to just say, no, I prefer males who don't do this then we wouldn't have these kinds of species in the first place. There right. must have been something that in some sense gave females leverage or something that changed, right? right. And, well, one of the, what I, what I, um, uh, I can answer that in a couple of ways. One, uh, in my lab right now, we're working on uh, population genetic modeling, basically uh, math theory, uh, you know, descended from the kind of ideas that, that uh, uh, the kind of models that uh, that Fisher and, and and company did, right? So we have uh, a mathematical population genetic theory that show the efficacy of the aesthetic remodeling idea. Uh, now, when female choice is zero, when that there is no choice, then yes, we have a barrier to this to happen. But when female choice is positive, that is when there's some number, some percentage of all of the matings in the population are determined by free choice, uh, then we have shown how this, uh, these kind of innovations can snowball, how basically by transferring um, the determination of, uh, of, 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 of reproduction from uh, male competition to female choice, you uh, you can basically have a snowball effect, right? Uh, now, so that's the first answer. The answer is that it's 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 mathematically and genetically plausible. Now, the conditions in early on in the the, the exclusive line, and we're talking about uh, the line that gave rise to Homo sapiens, which is the sister group to chimpanzees and bonobos, right? It's about what five to seven million years old. So at some point, and I think very early in that line. Uh, things started to change. How do we go from essentially no choice uh, to some choice to this process? Uh, well, um, you know, uh, that we, we don't have that data. Okay. Right? Um, but I do think that, that it's essential. Look, everything about humans that make us unique require greater investment in offspring. You know, we've got bigger brains, longer childhoods. Uh, we, we need to learn language, culture, material culture, you know, uh, et cetera, right? You could never have evolved to have greater investment in offspring while maintaining this this tremendous chaos caused by uh, by by male infanticide. Mm -hmm. A female simply is not going to up the investment to make even bigger, smarter, brainier kids 
if you, you're getting a certain high percentage of them murdered every generation or so as a result of male social violence, right? That's not going to happen. So solving the infanticide problem, I think, is 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 as key an issue to the origin of of uh, you know the richness of, of 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 human beings as there is because you couldn't have gotten. Uh, 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 over, you couldn't have evolved for any ecological purpose. You couldn't have gotten the female to do it because of the 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 the, the, the chaotic costs of, of social uh, of social violence, right? Okay. So, so I think it's a big deal. Uh, I also think that female choice was involved in the origin of male investment. You know, it, at some point it was popular to think of of, of uh, sexual monogamy as a kind of minimal harem size, uh, uh, an institution of you know male uh, male control, but if if we really look at at, 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 at at who benefits from male reproductive investment, uh, that, uh, then we see it's it's females. Almost uh, ubiquitously throughout primates, you know, very rarely you have male investment, but mostly it's the female doing all of the work. And, and that's just not the way humans are. And the question is, who benefited? I think the, 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 the issue was uh, was uh, females. Well, they both could have benefited, right? I mean, if, if- uh, males seem to have been equipped by natural selection in our species with uh, traits that 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 encourage investment. I mean, males fall in love with their children and they and they do all these things. So it's, it's certainly I, not I, impossible I, that there were uh, fitness it, it, benefits it, it, to the male. Right. The, the aesthetic capacity of males to fall in love is a it is an exact consequence of female choice for aesthetic remodeling. And what they remodeled was the so male. I think it's not in the interest of males uh, in Darwinian terms to invest in their in their offspring. It's it's, it's kind of they're almost being See, duped. Obviously, the, the, re, the reason it happened is a big, because it became so. But it's certainly not in in gorillas and chimpanzees, you know, uh, and, 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 and how did it become? Well, of course, there's it, lots it, of things that aren't that, that are distinctive to our species. But that doesn't mean they're all the result of that, that they don't benefit the males in the species. Well, anyway, it didn't. It didn't. It didn't benefit it until it benefited. The way it benefited them was meeting the the the, the aesthetic stringency of female choice. You know, once you're once you're a loser uh, because yes. you're 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 asocial, uh, unable to be social and and violent. Uh, then uh, then and you, and you, and as a result, you have no mates. That well, you're going to get hip to the program. You're going to figure out. Wow, you know, if I start re- uh, you know being able to make eye contact, which uh, chimpanzees and gorillas have trouble doing compared to bonobos and humans, et cetera, et cetera. You 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 become social, mm-hmm. and that and that and that happens through female choice. Okay, now there's a lot of interesting stuff in your book. We don't have time for all of it. I want to touch on one more subject quickly, and in the interest of saving time, let me just uh, try to set the stage and then let you uh, trot out your particular theory. This has to do with female orgasm. There have been a number of uh, attempts to explain female orgasm, and, and quickly, I mean, the reason it's thought of as needing explanation is that with male orgasm, the orgasm accompanies the accomplishment of the biological mission. You've, you, you've, you've discharged the semen. That's what the desire was apparently designed by natural selection to get you to do. You've done it. The, the, so, so the peak desire has been reached. It subsides, and that's kind of the thinking. With females, uh, orgasm doesn't necessarily correspond to the biological. It's, it's just not so obvious what it's for. So there have been different theories to explain it. One is the so-called upsuck theory where, uh, you know, the idea is they tried to show empirically, I don't know if they ever succeeded, that there was some kind of correlation uh, between uh, orgasm and actually retaining the semen. And if that were the case, I'm not sure it is, but if it were the case, that it could be the case that the function of orgasm, it's it's almost a, a, a tool of female choice. In other words, uh, those males who are so desirable that they excite you to the point of orgasm are the ones whose, whose uh, sperm you want to keep, and orgasm is a tool for keeping it, blah, blah, blah. There's another one, uh, Donald Simons' uh, view was that, uh, uh, that orgasm was not an adaptation, even in the broad sense of the term that we discussed. It was uh, just an artifact of, of uh, well, it, it was... It's it's kind of as you explain in the book. It's kind of like why do males have nipples? Well, because females have them, and for whatever reason, males are left with this rudimentary version. In females, they're functional, and males are not. A similar story is told in orgasm. We don't have time to elaborate, but in any event, you have a different theory, right? Yeah, the two the two the two theories. One, you know, the 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 upsuck uh, theory and the and the byproduct theory. The idea that it's a byproduct of selection on male orgasm. Um, both have one thing in common, 
which is that female sexual pleasure is, in essence, irrelevant, right? The, the upsuck theory is actually that uh, 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 genetically superior quality males are the males that are going to be inducing orgasm and that the mechanical contractions of the uterus are actually sucking the sperm of these high quality males closer to the ova, giving them a biased possibility of giving, uh, of, uh, of arising. And it is actually, by the way, this only works if the female is, is, is mating with multiple males simultaneously during the same fertile period, right? So, uh, and, and, uh, uh, and, and so, and the byproduct can, as you uh, said, is basically that it's, uh, it's an accident, maybe a happy accident, but still an accident. Well, what I try to say is that, is that essentially uh, some uh, uh, um, exquisite uh, aesthetic pleasure like uh, female orgasm actually uh, deserves its own uh, evolutionary explanation. In particular, um, you know, evolutionary biology, because of uh, our inability to access, uh, access the, the, the subjective experience of animals, have always seen female choice and preference as a black box acting upon the other. And so we look at the evolution of ornament and, 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 and leave that, 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 that subjective experience un, 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 unstudied and in some ways untheorized. But in fact, um, when we look at the breadth of kind of interactions that are involved in sexuality, uh, the experience of sexuality, they, I think of sexual pleasure itself as, uh, as getting what you want, as the actual quality, the subjective experience of having what you want. And, and what I propose in the book is that essentially it evolved through a fisherian runaway process. But instead of focusing on the ornament, we're also uh, exclusively, we're focusing on the preference, right? That that by having more and greater and more intensive capacity for pleasure, uh, females are advancing in their own capacity to 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 make decisions about who they want to mate and remate with. Uh, of course, remating is important because ovulation becomes. Uh, 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 hidden or, or, or in, in, in humans, uh, uh, um, uh, then, then, then sexuality itself becomes extended and also disconnected from fertility. So what that means is that most sexuality is unrelated to reproduction, right? Even in healthy, wild, non, uh, uh birth control producing, uh, uh, non birth control populations, the my majority of sexuality does not lead to sperm meets egg. So we're really talking about mating and remating preferences. And that's the, that's the area where we see orgasm evolving. So basically my theory is that female orgasm evolved, uh, or expanded in pleasure, uh, because females mated with those and remated with those males that gave them more sexual pleasure that led both to the expansion of the complexity, diversity, and temporal duration of, of sexual acts themselves, as well as the, the enhancement and expansion of the female capacity for sexual pleasure. So basically what it means is that female orgasm is both the proximate experience and the evolutionary product of women getting what they want. And this puts females directly as agents in the evolution of their own pleasure, which I think is a, is a, is a, is a fascinating uh, scientific idea. Okay, so is the, is the dynamic that females, uh, I mean, sex felt good to begin with, but they, uh, because it feels good, females would tend to choose males with features that made it feel better and better? Or and remate with those males who made it feel better. Uh huh. And Which, as a result, the actual amount of pleasure that females are capable of would grow through the generations. Correct, and uh, 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 through the same kind of uh, preference that the that the peacock's tail and the and the peahen's uh, aesthetic preferences. Right. I mean, uh, sexual pleasure is actually the physiological and cognitive consequence of having what you want, and that's what preference is all about. Right. So we usually think of preference as a black box, but it's actually a physiological experience. Right. And 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 and, and sexual. Pleasure. Now, the other interesting thing, I also argue, although I think it's correct that, uh, you know, uh, sexual pleasure for males has to occur for, in order for males to pursue sexuality. Mm -hmm. But I do think that human male uh, orgasm is probably more pleasurable than that explanation can can uh, can decide. So I think that. Um, 
you know, one thing that's also distinguishes human males from apes and chimpanzees is their sexual choosiness, right? Uh, you know, male chimps and chimps uh, and gorillas never refuse a sexual opportunity ever, mm. right? And unless it's with mom, right? And and so uh, that just doesn't happen in, in, in human males, right? Uh, human males are strikingly picky, and it's that the evolution of human male choosiness that really needs to be explained. This is why the idea that sperm is cheap and eggs are expensive, so males should be profligate and females are coy, has l- not that much to contribute to the understanding of human evolution. No, but the uh, idea, just to, just to flesh, human- but, but in defense of evolutionary psychology, which I know you're hostile to, I, I want to be clear on what the idea is there. Uh, the idea is that, um, yes, it, it, it makes sense for, for males in principle to to uh, have more sex than females because male females can only uh, reproduce once every couple of years. Males could, in theory, reproduce every day if they can find enough cooperating females. So you would expect uh, males well, to be uh, less choosy. Let me, let me finish. Let me finish. Uh, but that does not preclude the possibility. Evolutionary psychologists certainly recognize that uh, parental investment is an important part of our species, and you would expect that when men are mating with someone whose children they might invest with, in other words, they might settle down and be married to or whatever, then they would be extremely choosy. So uh, certain kinds of male choosiness are are certainly compatible with uh, the idea, which I think is amply uh, documented, that that males are sexually stimulated under a, a wider variety of circumstances than females and by a wider variety of partners. Um, you know, the the interesting thing, of course, is that is that uh, uh, as long as we're talking, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, male female sexual interactions, every single time that male is having some other interaction, it's got to be with another female. You know, the math is it, 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 it makes it so that the actual differences between the number of male and female sexual partners uh, is is constrained, right? Uh, unless those males are going for male sexual partners, right? Well, no, wait, 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 wait. No, no, it's competition among males for access to females. I mean, I'm not talking species level or group level selection. I'm talking about individual selection. No, right, right, right. I, and so am I. So for every, right, so the constraint you're talking about is is irrelevant. If I'm competing with my male neighbor for access to females, there's plenty of females for me to win or for him to win, right? That is correct. Uh, what I what I argue is that that level of uh, discussion contributes almost nothing to our understanding of how we got to be the way we are. Why not? Why, why not? Why, why is it that, that talking clearly? Is why that, is it that talking clearly the reality, about what chimps and gorillas? The reality is that chimps and gorillas live in that world. And humans don't. And so to get to be human from from the profligate, open ended sexuality of apes, you have to explain why that idea doesn't uh, uh, add up to human sexuality. And and that's what I argue in the book. At, 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 well, at some- I mean, there are lots of explanations for how parental investment got off the ground and, and so on. Uh, evolutionary psychologists are not oblivious to the fact that we're very different in all these ways. But I, I don't I don't know how a, a Darwinian biologist could say to me there's no value in talking about whether two males in a given species, whether one male in a given species can in principle have a reproductive advantage over another male, which is the kind of uh, discourse you just discouraged. As I no, understand. I, I, that's that's not what I said. What I said is that the 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 the, the paradigmatic discussion that sperm is cheap and eggs are rare uh contributes very little to understanding well, but wait but wait evolution of human beings you you agree that in the broad majority of species because females are sexually choose you right that is the very context of your whole book in a certain sense right you agree that that's and, the case and 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 and, 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 and in this case males are also okay uh, okay fine but why is it? But why is it generally that remains underexplained with by that theory? That theory contributes nothing to understanding why that should be so. But why, and that's why what I say is, it doesn't contribute to understanding why that is so? But what is your explanation for why it is usually the case 
that females are sexually choosy? Or do you have an explanation? Because I think the explanation is, agree. I think almost all evolutionary biologists agree that it does have to do with the relative rareness of eggs and, 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 and less, less uh, rareness of sperm as manifest in the fact that females can only uh, reproduce again, often males. Again, Rob, Bob, you have to under, you understand what my statement was. It was about human evolution. I understand that. But, yeah, and 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 and, and uh, etc. So right, that 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 uh, the advantage here. And so, as one of the interesting things is that chimpanzees are making more investment. They invest a hundred percent. Males contribute nothing but sperm, and yet they are entirely unchoosy. So that paradigm explains nothing about chimpanzee and gorilla biology. The, fe- the females they, are unchoosy. Female gorillas will will exceed because they have no. Well, power. female gorillas have no choice. They're in a harem. Exactly. Exactly. So they None are. Of this is news to evolutionary psychologists. But the reason I brought up the question of why females. So, but their eggs are just as expensive and actually, you know, uh, differentially expensive. So there's another example why that paradigm does not contribute. Well, their choice uh, has been and your, their choice has been successfully constrained by the males. They, they would be better off if they had choice. I think, we both, I think we both made ourselves clear. OK, let me just. But in closing, I do have to register one more more. Uh, and I actually have a question for you, too, that's separate from from this, though, related to it. But I, I, I have to say that uh, in, in defense of evolutionary psychologists, you write. Uh, you don't write this in defense of evolutionary psychologists. My reply is going to be in defense of them. You write contemporary evolutionary psychology has a profound con- con- constitutive, often fanatical commitment to the universal efficacy of adaptation by natural selection. The application of the concept of adaptation to human biology is the organizing principle of the field. Evolutionary psychologists view human sexual ornaments and behavior as a cornucopia of honest advertisement and adaptive strategies. Let me just say a couple of things squarely. Uh, first of all, they are far from seeing all behavior as honest advertisement. Dishonest advertisement in sex is a big theme in evolutionary psychology. But, was, but the, the, the idea that they are all adaptationist, the, 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 the theory of orgasm that we just discussed... That was the least adaptationist, in no, no that, sense adaptation. That's exactly is, incorrect. Because is Don reason, Simons, who is an architect of evolutionary psychology, he came right. up with that non-adaptationist explanation, right? He, he would he would not be at home in evolutionary psychology today, and we both know that because he was deposed he by, you by asked him? a mainstream evolutionary psychologist who proposed have, the upsuck theory. Have you Why asked Don if he's theory? at home in evolutionary psychology? I said he would not be comfortable in evolutionary psychology. I, I think we should ask him. Yeah. Well, I'm pretty sure I know what he'd say. Yeah. Well, but, I mean. But, 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 but the other guy you ignore, uh, I mean, you ignore a lot of, uh, it's just. Well, I mean. It's, uh, it's you know, a parody. I had, I had uh, uh, you know, maybe uh, 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 500% more on evolutionary psychology in the draft. And uh, maybe I should publish that elsewhere. But. Uh, it it was it was a productive thing to do. I think uh, some really good books, uh, you know, uh, uh, on, on that subject have already been written. Uh, I needed to deal with it, and I thought I did so in, in an efficient way. And actually, I I, I stand by what I said 100. percent I think it's really demonstrable in the long run that uh, evolutionary psychology, for the most part, has an intellectual problem, which is its dedication to an adaptive answer. Uh, and then looking for questions and data that support that answer, not actually a full uh, 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 evolutionary scope to understanding uh, evolutionary biology of humans. Well, I'd say, I'd say that largely okay. applies to evolutionary biology in general. I mean, evolutionary biologists tend to be adaptation. You're, uh, ap- yeah, adaptations I mean, and you're, that's, a, that's a problem there, yeah, too. But yeah, but I, but I would. There, there's a, a, a wrinkle I'd want to add to that. So, I mean, Don Simons is an example of a guy centrally associated with evolutionary psychology to this day, as far as I know, who, who had this flat out, totally non-adaptationist uh, in any sense of the term uh, theory of uh, orgasm, but uh, which you mentioned in the book. But there's another guy, Jeffrey Miller, who if you read the beginning of his book, the Ma- he's an evolutionary psychologist. If you read the beginning of his book, The Mating Mind, it actually sounds a lot like yours. It, it, uh, I think it has the same publisher, maybe even. But but it was, uh, I don't know, 15 years ago or something. He says, look, we have ignored Darwin's theory of sexual choice. We should think of uh, sexual uh, selection as separate from natural selection. Uh, so he is, he is not, uh, and some of his theories of sexual selection are not adaptationist in your sense of the term. Uh, so he's another he's another guy who's an evolutionary psychologist who... He may he, uh, who who is not adaptationist in the in the narrower sense uh, in which you you mean the term. But I wanted to just ask you in closing. Um, he 
what he emphasizes in his book, I, I, uh, I, I never read the whole thing. It's been a long time since I looked at it. But as I understand it, he has an idea that seems interesting to me, which is that, um, th- and, and I'm, well, let me, let me just say that, that a lot of uh, our very aesthetic sensibilities about art and music and things like that um, can be uh, attributed to sexual selection. And I assume that in the case of like music, he would probably say that that's a Fisherian runaway because like initially maybe a clear, strong voice signifies that I'm robust or something. But I mean, obviously, uh, once you get to, to, to the human c- capability uh, for harmony and so on, it's hard to imagine that you're doing anything uh, more than impressing uh, somebody <laughs> who's probably in the opposite sex. And quickly, I would add, he begins that book by disagreeing with Steve Pinker on this issue be- because, interestingly, Steve Pinker, another evolutionary psychologist, Steve has a view that's non-adaptationist in a broader sense. He thinks aesthetics is a spandrel. So again, these are three people, Pinker, Jeff Miller, Don Simons, who to varying degrees, they're all like important, You've, you know them all, who varying degrees do not comply with your description, your emphatically general uh, description of evolutionary psychology. Well, uh, one, I would say that all three of those people would probably proudly describe themselves as adaptationists, right? So, so these are uh, all examples of right. them being non-adaptationists right, when right. they so, think that's so, appropriate. You know, uh, to, to borrow from the electric Kool-Aid acid test, you know, you might say they know they they know where it is, but they don't know what it is, right? So maybe uh, I think it's true, and I've quoted Jeff Miller in my chapter on on orgasm, well, right? To dismiss uh, right, him, he was, yeah, he was but tiptoeing up to the thing. But given uh, the intellectual environment he's in, which is strongly adaptationist, he didn't he couldn't see how to get over to express what it was he was thinking in in in, in, in this way. I, I, I'd like to think he'd enjoy the book. And but I haven't I haven't communicated to him. But but, but you know, um, um, you know, I, uh, I, I think that um, that the field of evolutionary psychology, in many cases, is proudly dedicated to the notion that adaptation by natural selection in humans is its organizing principle. Right? Uh, I mean that. The, I mean, the, the, this is uh, go to their go to people's websites or to journals uh, and read what, how they describe the field. I don't think that's a misrepresentation. No, I, of- I think they're very much like evolutionary biologists, which is that that the working context of initial inquiry. Is you look for things uh, that might be uh, adaptations. If they're not obvious adaptations, you try to think of ways they might be. But all three of these people I've cited are, are uh, examples uh, of, uh, of people who, you know, when, when the evidence seems to dictate, they depart from adaptationism either in the 19th century sense of the term, as Miller did, or in the 20th century term, as both Pinker and Simons did. So I think, yeah, that's the way they work. That's the way evolutionary biologists work. I, I don't think, I mean, you know, you're, you, you say some, you almost call evolutionary psychologists dishonest. You say there's never any doubt what the conclusion of any evolutionary psychology study will be. The only question is how far the study will have to go to get there. Well, first of all, there is doubt because evolutionary psychologists disagree on things, as I, as I just said, but, but, but you're almost imputing dishonesty to them. And I just think, it's, it seems to me that the process, the procedure I've described of inquiry is a reasonable way to proceed. But that's an, ext- that's an extension of the exact criticism that I make to modern Wallacean biologists, which I call a faith-based intellectual program, right? I mean, to conclude that, uh, that, uh, that made choice, or to start with the assumption that made choice is adaptive, support that theory when you, when you find it, but then say, oh, when you don't find it, say, oh, we haven't worked hard enough to find evidence in favor of it. Uh, that's the operating paradigm in the vast majority of animal behavior studies on made choice, right? And I'm highly critical of that as well. Right. Uh, uh, fortunately, I think uh, uh, animal behavior and, and evolutionary biology have a lot more richness and other aspects to the to the program. That's not synonymous with the field. I think in evolutionary ecology, it's very close to synonymous to the field. That's why I wrote what I did. Yeah. I, and look, it's an interesting book. I, I just think that you seem as determined to emphasize your themes as you look at, for explanations and, and female choice and so on as evolutionary psychologists or evolutionary biologists are uh to to find their themes uh and in some cases yeah. that you're at I, a level where all you can say is the explanation is conjectural for now and i think that's fine in all three cases i just think uh, and, and actually, it's, it's actually, not i don't think it's a basis for indicting people's character well i i don't i don't think that i did that 
I don't think that's a, uh, that's a statement. But that's a way that uh, uh, the way the intellectual uh, uh, field is organized, right? And 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 I, and I think and I and I actually think it's accurate. If you look at the 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 the, the abstracts from a set of papers from the Journal of Evolutionary Psychology, et cetera, and try to find the ones that actually go against the grain, uh, you'll, 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 you'll be waiting a long time, right? Uh, why is that? Because, uh, the, and, and also I, I see, a, I do see a pattern of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, you know, for example, self-citation in in the area of orgasm. I found there were, uh, in the upsuck literature, uh, I had a lot more to say about that that I, I cut down on. Yeah, but that, that's, there, I mean, there, it's there, interesting. Are that, there are some papers that, that, you know, there are papers, for example, that falsify or that propose that the asymmetry of the male partner is related to the orgasm frequency of the female. Right. Mm -hmm. And and then there was another paper later that falsified that idea and yet cited the first paper positively in both the in, in both the introduction and the discussion. Mm -hmm. Right. They had literally the main contribution of their paper was to falsify the previous paper. Now, that's the kind of uh, self-dealing because uh, that says, oh, well, you know, we're all in the same field. We're all working uh, toward the same end. Uh, that that, that it, um, it is a sort of a sign of, uh, you know, uh, uh, an, another mission. And the mission is to further the field and the field's goal of of uh, of an adaptation. Is that, is that any different from your commitment to your own theoretical perspective? Well, you know, I, I mean, I spend a lot of time in the book talking about how we should do science. Uh, we didn't talk about about the null model and how we should distinguish between adaptationism or but I, but everybody I everybody supports I, the null model in principle. The, the question is, you know, where is your brain actually know, leading you? I, that'd be that'd be nice, Bob. But this is my liter my work, both scientifically in this book, is the first mention of null models and sexual selection. Right? That that's a fact. Right? So I've been proposing this and getting nowhere with it. One reason to write the book is because people are so resistant to the concept of null models in 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 in, in mate choice. So anyway, I proposed an explicit intellectual change that. Will allows to understand better how the world is. And I think that's uh, explicit advance that talks exactly about uh, what you're what you're interested in, which is uh, approaching a better uh, description of nature. Right. So uh, that's something that I haven't seen come out of uh, evolutionary psychology, certainly not in regard to to human evolution. So. So, yeah, I do think that uh, my view is different or my and my approach to science is different. Yeah. OK. The uh, just quickly, you mentioned the upsuck theory. I was actually at the conference where that theory was unveiled, and it was interesting because it was broadly speaking, you could say, an evolutionary psychology conference. It was the Human Behavior and Evolution Society, and uh, the uh, after the presentation, people were talking about it, and there were a whole lot of people who looked at the data and just said, "This is just not convincing." I mean, that was just the talk in the halls, and then to this day, if you look back at that. Uh, well, there's that theory. That was, I guess, in a context of evolutionary psychology. Don Simons was probably there. He has a different theory. Jeff Miller may well have been there. He has a third theory, which you mentioned in the book. And, and, and I just want to emphasize, there, there's, uh, and some of those are adaptations, some are not. Um, there's uh, a lot more disagreement within the field than I think you give it uh, credit for. All that said, it's certainly true that I think uh, fundamentally Thomas Kuhn in the structure of scientific revolutions was right that people are scientists are committed to their theories. They try to find uh, verification of them. Uh, and, and as a rule, the, the most effective falsification comes from people uh, of different perspectives or who, for whatever reason, want to falsify their work. I think it's true of evolutionary psychology, evolutionary biology. You say that you are, as I understand it, exempt from this uh, psychological dynamic. Congratulations, um, but but I don't think it's an unusual. I never one. said that. I said that 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 part of my goal in the book and my previous work is to is to propose and to advocate um, uh, uh, an intellectual framework right. for organizing the discipline that allows us to make progress on exactly that, these kinds of debates. That's your job I to propose and to advocate. Exactly, that's your job, and you did it well. It's an interesting book. Thank you. Okay. Any last, uh, any last thing you want to say? Yeah, well, you know, what, you, you mentioned art, and I think that's really fascinating. There is this this area of uh, of um, uh, you know literary Darwinism or, or 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 Darwinism in the humanities that proposes that the capacity for aesthetic expression uh, is a kind of uh, a, a indicator of of mate quality, right? So Daniel Dutton wrote a, a book a few years ago called the the Art Instinct, right, which got right into that. And 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 um, you know uh, the, uh, you know my book is I've I think it was Dennis Dutton, I believe. Dennis Dutton, sorry, yeah, D Dennis Dutton. And and the 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 um, 
uh, my book has been critical of of that concept in biology, but it also does the counter, which is which is to make new connections to how uh, the relationship between uh, between you know birdsong and and art and human art. It is a different way, and 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 I refer to it in the in the, in the conclusion and in some uh, work I've had in aesthetic uh, philosophy, where I propose that art is a kind of communication that co-evolves with its evaluation. And in this case, evaluation having to do with you know whether you like it or not. Uh, and and so um, uh, and, and so I'm doing other work and really interested in in this kind of uh, reframing of the idea of aesthetics and 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 the nature of art to include non-human examples. Uh, and this is, uh, I think, another really exciting way in which this uh, idea uh, is leading to new kinds of connections to the humanities. Uh, another of those is the explicit uh, statement, right, that sexual autonomy matters to animals. And I count this as a fundamentally feminist scientific discovery, not one uh, that's feminist in the way that we might construct a set of theories on the basis of prior political uh, ideas, but one where we discover that some aspect of what what is uh, we would consider feminist theory in in and, and feminist concerns in the, in the human realm are not unique to people, but have are 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 a fundamental consequence of social sexual interactions, and 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 that leads I, I think to a really really exciting new interconnection, but between uh, feminism, gender studies, et cetera, and, uh, and evolutionary biology. And those are multiple ways in which I hope to, uh, to, uh, to uh, enrich uh, uh, new intellectual relations with social, uh, between evolutionary biology and, and the rest of academia and, 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 and human, human lives. Mm -hmm. So uh, those are other aspects of the book that I really uh, am excited about. One quick word on art, and then I'll let you have the last word and, and promise not to say anything else. But but I was thinking while reading your book uh, and thinking how hard sometimes it is to distinguish between natural selection and sexual selection. If you if you divide them up that way, I was thinking like the, of the statue of David, you know, the famous statue, like suppose a heterosexual woman is looking at that statue and thinking, hmm, nice statue. And you know, <laughs> it's like finding it kind of attractive. Now, it could be, I mean, part of it is the musculature, right? That's a good, you know, that's a good specimen. But it could be, I mean, certainly some of the musculature is fitness, is, is fit, represents fitness in the 19th century since the term. The guy can get around, he's agile, he can go find food. For all we know, some of the musculature uh, is a result of his ancestors having uh, bested other males and gotten mates. Now, can you distinguish between, you know, you take my point. It's hard. It's it's like, what is the nature of the female's aesthetic attraction? Is it, you know, it, it's hard to separate what's rooted in sexual selection and, and natural selection in the 19th century sense, which may be one reason I prefer the 20th century aggregation uh, and, and seeing sexual selection, selection as a subset of natural selection. But whatever you want to say about Statue of David, uh, please say, and then I'll go away. But we, well, we, uh, a couple of things. One, one uh, Darwin uh, uh, really elaborately tried to answer this question. I don't think he came up with definitive ways to treat them, but he discussed it. And he was basically saying, look, uh, you know, uh, uh, certain kinds of, of, uh, of copepods or invertebrates knee in the, in the ocean. Uh, the males need uh, limbs in order to grasp females, right? So this is fundamentally natural selection because you can't just reproduce without it. But in some species, those, those limbs are large enough that they're actually about control, right? So he said, well, so the limb is natural selection, but these aspects of the components of the limb are, are this way. I, I elaborate in the book the same thing with the human penis. Aspects of the penis are under natural selection, and other aspects, I think, are under sexual selection, likely female choice, right? So, so, so um, it's not easy, but I think we have a pathway for, for making those decisions. Now, the other thing I'll say about the Statue of David is that I, I think the sculpture was Michelangelo, right? And, and who, who was a guy. And, uh, and, and someone who is well documented to have had strong uh, same sex sexual uh, attractions and, and, and relationships, right? So that's a whole other aspect of re regarding the Statue of David. And, and, and I think same sex attraction, same sex behavior is a big part of the natural history of human biology. And there's a chapter I'm very excited about in the book, uh, that is explicitly about the evolution of same sex attraction in humans, uh, and has a, uh, has a particularly, 
uh, uh, aesthetic and uh, and sexual autonomy spin to it. Right. So uh, I, I, I'm, I'm excited about that work as well. Yeah, that is, I wish we had time to talk about your explanation of the evolution of uh, uh, homosexuality, bisexuality, and so on. It's certainly found in other uh, species related to us, like uh, bonobos, and uh, and you have uh, what I'm pretty sure are new things to say about it. So another reason people uh, should get the book, um, it's called Aesthetic. Uh, no, it's not. It's called The Evolution of Beauty, How Darwin's Forgotten Theory of Mate Choice Shapes the Animal World and Us. It's been uh, well received. Uh, and I believe was named, uh, didn't the New York Times Book Review name it as something? One of the top 10 books. One of the top 10 books. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, one of the first uh, science books in a while. And uh, and also uh, one of the first uh, you know, uh, bio, non-biomedical science books in a while, too. So uh, mm-hmm. it's uh, it's been really exciting. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Rick. And, thank uh, you for tolerating. It's been it's been it's been a pleasure. Well, and what, thank what, you for tolerating me. Certain subjects get me to raise my voice. I'm sorry. My I'm, I, I, I'm trying. I meditate, and I'm trying. I'm trying to become better. I meditate now. But <laughs> all right. Take care. Take care. Good day.